Welcome to The Heart of the Cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. With your hosts, Dan Green and Eric Stewart. Welcome to The Heart of the Cards. I'm joined by my friend and actor and producer and director and singer-songwriter, Eric Stewart. Oh, thank you, Dan. And I, of course, am once again beside my good friend, talented voice actor, director, artist, writer, and I'm going to say it again, I've heard you're a good cook, (laughs) Dan Green. (laughs) My kids are lying to you. They're lying to you. I mean, if hot dogs are your thing. You never um, know. Yeah. Uh, yes, it, they, have, they have to be veggie ones, but yes, I'll do it. <laughs> that's that's fine. That's fine. Um, so it's the same setting in the cooker. So uh, <laughs> and, and we're <laughs> and we're we're delighted uh, to be joined today by our wonderful friend and colleague Gregory Abbey. Yeah, who you know from so many things, uh, probably namely you say on uh, Yu Gi Oh Five Ds. Um, but also Tristan and, you know, of course, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, but what you may not know about Greg Abbey is that uh, he's recently appeared on Law & Order on camera. He does has done a lot of on-camera stuff throughout the years. He and I produced, actually, uh, a series of uh, one-act plays twice. Yep. Yep. Um, and that was probably one of my favorite experiences. And um, But Greg, Greg also does video production and is finishing a degree in creative writing, writing for film and television. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I think... I literally texted Greg recently that I was just so impressed with his commitment to developing that part of his creativity. Nice. And I'll send you pictures if you don't believe me. <laughs> and, Thanks, pal. Uh, but we're... <laughs> oh, no, man. Thank you. And Greg and I, has been has been mentioned on this podcast before, have been friends for over 30 years and uh, met while going to Mason Gross School of the Arts together yep. and back in the 90s. And well, I guess it was the late eighties into the nineties. I mean, who's we'll... who's counting years? But sure, <laughs> <laughs> it was sometime uh, in the past, many many years it was. ago. It was when you guys it were in was. kindergarten. It was that. That's yes, was. Eric, I believe you're correct. In the late eighties, in the late eighties, yeah. when we were both yeah. in kindergarten. That's right. It was it was the weird policy they had. They were yeah. accepting kindergartners into into college. <laughs> really weird. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're delighted to have you with us, Greg. I am psyched to be here with you fellas, my old friends. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've only known Eric for about 20 years. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> Barely <laughs> yeah, 20 was... years. Uh, yeah, it... I would say around more, 2000, more. right? Yeah. It, it's got to be more, yeah. 2000? Yeah, definitely. When all the magic started? Yeah, I, I worked with you a lot um, over the years. It's, uh, yeah, and, and I'm st- I can still live to tell about it. Yeah, which is really, really a feat, because I'm a nightmare to work with. Right, yeah, that's, that's, I'm, that's your reputation. We did yeah. have a few yeah, fist really. fights, Eric and I. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I feel like it must have, was it 2000, Eric? I mean, I don't even remember, were you directing uh, Yu-Gi-Oh? It sort of all yep. blends together for me. When I yeah, started when the, as Tristan? Yep, when they brought me in to direct. And, and you took you, over for Sam Regal, so even that was a little yeah. skewed yeah. in right. terms of the timing. Yeah, right? yeah. But yeah, it's got to be 2000. That's probably correct. It's crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. For our younger listeners out there, you might be familiar with the expression that time flies. Believe it. Indeed. Uh, it happens. <laughs> yep. yeah. No, I'm excited that you're uh, doing the show with us today. I mean, we haven't uh, had a chance to really chat too much. Um, and I and I do follow what you are doing on, on the socials um, to, uh, to keep up with your career and, and some of your life. But I think our, our listeners will really enjoy hearing uh, your thoughts on all the things that we talk about. Cool, man. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's nice to catch up. Yeah, well, something that's fun for me is that I'm I'm such you know good friends with Greg, and I'm also good friends with Eric. But you guys really don't uh, haven't had that much time hanging out with each other. That's right. So it'll no. be fun for me to listen to you guys cross pollinate here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think the last th- you know I was just it just occurred to me, Eric. I think the last time we really spoke and hung out was at that convention in Cleveland, right? Maybe. Wow. Do you remember that? And there was a bacon convention in the same hotel? Yes. I was just <laughs> telling that story this weekend. That was Rain, hilarious. Oh, my God. The signs that said bacon. And and I thought it was like, I was like, what is bacon? Like, I was asking them what they do. And they're like, oh, no, no. This no, is no, a, this, this is, is bacon. Well, not like, this only is... that, 
I mean, you tell me if I'm misremembering, but I think there was also a BBW Big Beautiful Women. Yes, uh, you. Convention. Oh my goodness! Yes, that's what that that event was going on in the hotel bar. Oh but my the, god! But the but the the bacon, as I thought it was pronounced, and later was corrected <laughs> when I asked them. First of all, they for some strange reason the people that ran bacon recognized me and asked me if I wanted to Weird. hang out with in their convention, which was featuring the love of. Bacon and video games. Yeah. <laughs> hey, wow. I see it. It's a combo. What a great, what a, I can't believe you remember. That is anyway, so yeah, that's anyway. the last time we got to hang out. But it's good to, it's good to speak with you again. <laughs> yes, you too. All right, Dan. Are you, <laughs> let, we need to get to business, Dan. You're going to ask, you're going to, okay. you got a question you want to start you, off our, our, our oh, beloved yeah, guest? Yeah, we're, we're going to, we're going to grill Greg. Oh, that's boy. right. Yeah. yeah. Put him on the hot seat. Well, just like as, bacon. Uh, just <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's all coming together. <laughs> we, we're going to rename this the heart of the griddle. Um, so, as we do in this show, we have been using the hero's journey as a way to kick off conversations because the hero's journey contains elements in it that are universal, anybody can relate to. We had a wonderful conversation with Veronica Taylor not too long ago and hit on some of these uh, elements. And actually, Greg, I'm not sure if you remember, hmm. but when we were at Rutgers and we were doing the shoestring players, right? and we were working with Joe Hart, who I've mentioned previously, um, he, he worked with us using a lot of these principles of right. Joseph Campbell's work in The Hero's Journey because in the shoestring players, we were essentially adapting fairy tales and mythology tales right. in, in the form of, of theater. And what was great, the reason it was called Shoestring Players is because it was only the performers on the stage and like a couple of percussionists. Mm -hmm. So there was, it was as though you're on a shoestring budget. So we everything we did to create the stories had to be done by the ensemble of actors. And it was a wonderful experience of learning what ensemble work uh, yeah. can really be about. Yeah, um, right. I had so, forgotten that about Joe, but you're right. He talked about that a ton when we were putting that show right, together. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, with that said, why don't we start with one of the first steps of the hero's journey? And, mm. and of course, just, you know, nobody fits these patterns perfectly. Right. But you have had success pursuing a life with your creativity. And what was your call to adventure? When did you feel like this was the path for you to follow? Um, I would say, I, I think I was always kind of a natural performer from like super young. And there were mm -hmm. probably a lot of reasons for that, which we all have. Um, part of it was because I think I, I did love performing part of it because I love the attention, which through a number of years of therapy, I've been able to sort out the genesis of that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, when I was 12, I went to visit my uncle Rob in New York City, which Dan, you've, oh, yes. you've heard remember, about. I remember hearing. Yeah, you've heard. Uncle you've, Rob you've heard, was Yeah, you've a heard hero about this forever. For he was definitely a hero. Yes. Um, and I, I, I kind of had, I, I didn't have a super close relationship with him because he lived in New York City. I grew up in the Midwest, but we always connected. Like when I would, we see each other at holidays. Like I always felt very kismet with him, even as a kid. And um, so when I was twelve, my my parents let me go to New York City. Um, to visit him. And I went for two weeks. And I mean, it it really changed my life. I, I, I came to mm -hmm. New York. I'd never been. I was totally blown away by the city. My uncle was an actor and he was like 30 years old. And, you know, I subsequently I ended up visiting him every summer for a few weeks after that trip. But that first initial trip was just kind of magical you know, I, what I remember about him was he was parental, but he kind of treated me as an equal. And he, he kind of took me to shows like he I remember mm. the first show I saw with him was The Chorus Line. And and I remember, though, even mm -hmm. after that, even though that was not really a traditional Broadway musical, he was like, OK, I took you to a musical. Let's go see some other stuff. And he would take me to, like, <laughs> you know, I saw Bob and Gilead, which was a Steppenwolf production that John Malkovich had directed that, you know, I was like 13 mm -hmm. when I saw which that, but, which was later done at Rutgers. Right. Well, they did an amazing production of it. That was probably my yeah. favorite show. At Ed Rutgers. Stern directed that at Rutgers. Yes. Yeah. That was an yes. incredible Who's production. later gone on to win Tony's for his own work. Anyway, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. It, that's an amazing play. I, I So that oh, that yeah. just literally reshaped my brain. And he was he was auditioning. 
Um, and so I would, I would follow him around to auditions. And I remember just thinking like, and at that point I'd already been into performing. I had done whatever, you know, like school plays or class shows or whatever it was. So I was, I already had a, an interest in performance, but then to go to Broadway, go to off Broadway, uh, I fell in love with New York city. Um, and also he was an actor. And so it suddenly seemed I'm fall, I'm going to auditions with him. I think he booked a commercial when I was there. And so it really mm-hmm. settled in on me, like, oh, wait a second. You can, can this you is do a life this? You can live. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. really set in. Like, I came home, I really came home at 12 and was like, I think I might want to do this. As an independent production company, Andromeda greatly benefits from the support of its audience. If you're able to contribute as little as a dollar a month, consider going to our Patreon page. Any support you can give means a lot to us creators, and we're excited to bring you more. Visit AndromedaProductions.com and see what's in store. If this is content you enjoy, please like, subscribe, and share on YouTube. So, I mean, that that was probably it. And like I said, it, I went back every summer after that. Um, I mean, I ended up at Rutgers because my uncle studied with Bill Esper, um, right. He, he was in his first class, actually, in the city. And I remember when I was looking at schools. And and let me just, uh, for our listeners who may not know, Bill Esper was a legendary acting actor him, himself, but also acting teacher. Right. And who j- passed away just a few years ago, ju- actually. Yeah, just a few years ago. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just had a really close relationship with my uncle, not just the summers, but we wrote letters. You know, I just, he, we just had a really, and I'm still close to him to this day. We, we talk all the time. We talk about theater and art and books. And so, yeah. So when I, when I was looking at, I, I decided even, I think like at 16, I was like, I want to go to the, I want to study acting in college. And I applied to a bunch of conservatories and, and Rob said, you know, I think Bill heads the program at Rutgers. So that's how I ended up there. And that's how I met Mr. Dan Green. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Well, okay. And, and Anthony Salerno, who's that, a part of this anime. Yeah. yeah. So to, Brotherhood. To, yeah. to rewind just a second, since I don't know all of the uh, ins and outs of all of, of these relationships as much as maybe Dan does. Um, right. Did you come from, was well, there any other uh, creative influences um, in terms of your parents, grandparents? Was, was acting or any of the arts part of your environment besides your uncle? You know, it's funny. I think at the time I I wasn't totally in touch with it and no one really in the arts, but my, my father who was in the air force for 30 years and it's mm-hmm. kind of a, I would say moderately conservative and kind of a pragmatic guy. He was an exquisite drum is an exquisite drummer. He, he played in a band all through high school and all through college. I am I am 100% convinced he could have been like a studio drummer. He, he mm-hmm. really was mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. Self-taught, um, and he played, even when he wasn't in band, when I was growing up, like he'd go down every Sunday and play for four hours. Like we couldn't bother him. That was like his release. Right. He did, he did stained glass. He plays piano by ear. Um, so he, he, I, that art artistry is definitely in my family from him, I think, but, but certainly right. my uncle was the only, is the only kind of actor performer in the well, family. And I've, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting uh, or, or, you know, having occasions to be with Greg's parents from time to time. And one thing that his father radiates is this is a guy who gets things done. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so with that, with that, though, even though he wasn't a, an actor, um, right. I think that that I think that this leads to my next question where I might understand a little bit more of why you were able to follow what your 12 year old self has des- had decided to do. When you brought this idea up to your parents, right? How did that? How did that go over? Well, I think because my mom's brother was an actor, that certainly helped. And then I also just think my parents—not that their parents weren't bad, but they were not necessarily supportive. So I think mm-hmm. my parents felt like whatever you—they were kind of hands off, but ultimately it came down to whatever you want to do, we want to support. And I and I still. Which is amazing. I feel incredibly lucky. I I still remember the day, you know, my junior year of high school, my father was actually at at a war college for a year and he didn't make my mother and I move because I would have had to move my junior and then my senior year. And he was like, Mm. why don't you stay here? Stay here with mom. I'll go down to this school. And he had come back for the weekend. and I still remember him sitting down. I mean, I'm I'm sure they were whatever, 
nervous about me pursuing a career in the arts, but sure. they never really expressed that to me. And I still remember him sitting down and saying, I think I, at that point I had said like, I want to go to a conservatory. I want to study acting. And I still remember him sitting down and it, it, this wasn't in their nature maybe to do this as much, but I remember him sitting down and say, Hey, I know you want to do this. Let's do it right. What do we have to do? You know, let's, let's figure this out. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think because of their, they were just supportive by nature. And also I think because my mm-hmm. mom's brother was an actor, it didn't seem insane. I mean, he was in the city, right. he was mm-hmm. making a living, but, you know, but mm-hmm. you're also, mm-hmm. I, I guess you're, you know, who you are, um, as a son, um, hmm. to, to a father that might have, you know, has the checklist of things you do to get it done. Um, looked at this and said, well, he's going to work hard to do this, so then that's the thing he's going to do. You weren't saying, Dad, I want to hang out on the couch and wait for the phone to ring um, right. and see if I become an actor. You were like, I have I have a plan. So it's just interesting it, because especially when you're talking about a more conservative family unit right, um, right. where those actors or those artists can come from, sometimes you'd be very surprised at who is the most supportive. I, I, I've talked about the fact mm-hmm. that my mother – coming from the arts, being a dancer, was very nervous about me pursuing the arts right. because of her experience in right. that. Um, very supportive. Uh, you know, my, my mother uh, supports everything that I do, but she's also very honest about the the fear factor of that. So I'm just, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, I'm very curious about that. But anyway, so that was, that no, was no, my- I mean, I mean, and it, to be honest, Eric, like I, having been an actor and in trying to pursue a creative life for all these years, like I feel more, I think my parents with my parents a little bit as ignorant as bliss, like with my yeah. own kids, <laughs> right. with, my own, with my own kids. I'm like, right. I, I mean, I mean, my son's in film school. My daughter had flirted right. with being an actor. Like I'd certainly support them, but I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I basically, I, what I say to young people and I've said this to my kids, like, you have to love it. You have to love it so much or don't do it because it's mm-hmm. it's hard. Like if you have something else, if you feel on the fence, if you're passionate right. about something else, like don't do it because it's hard. So I think right. I think part of it with my parents was just like, sure, this is what you're into. Okay, cool. Good luck. I, you know, let's let's try to figure it out. Another thing though that Greg probably wouldn't say about himself, and I think it's something, and I'm interpreting his parents here, but Greg is such a reliable guy mm-hmm. that I I presume his parents could give him that leeway because even if that didn't pan out, Greg's the kind of person that's going to land on his feet. Right. Right. Uh, so. Well, I guess I, so. I said you wouldn't say this about yourself. <laughs> I mean, I get. I, I, yeah, I think I definitely had that. I, I, I definitely was ambitious and was kind of hardworking and wanted to try to do well. And so I think they understood yeah. that, that I wasn't looking at it as some folly and they yeah, knew I right. would go to school. And, and they also just knew how I was so into it. I was so passionate about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my reasons for that have shifted over time, but... I did sure. theater in high school. They knew how much I loved New York and going to Broadway, and I was serious about it. Like they, they could just tell. Like, oh, he's this is not this is not a folly for him. Like he wants to do right. this. It's, you know, it's not a fad or you yeah. Know, it's not super. It's not superficial. It's not superficial. I love the fact yeah. that at age twelve they gave you permission to go to New York to spend a week with your uncle. Um, to do that. I mean, that to me, uh, there's a trust level there, but also just, hey, go and see this amazing city and how crazy things are there as a life experience. I mean, that's that's also very cool for from a a parental. uh, Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel lucky they were amazing parents, but I have to say, I think it was also a bit of that generation that it yeah. was also just kind of hands off. I don't I don't know. They were like, sure. Like, it's almost yeah. like not paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. OK, cool. I'll get you the plane. Ticket. Oh, God. Just let us know when you get back. Well, I, I think I, yeah, I just I, I know I think I know the answer to this question. Um, and even though you are both come from different backgrounds. Did either of your parents really know what the hell you were doing after school and before dinner? Like, I mean, didn't we just have free reign, you know, at that time? Pretty much. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, my mom was kind of a stay-at-home mom, so she probably had more of a sense. But it was definitely a, a little bit of, and Eric, I don't know what your experience was, but it was a little hear no evil, see no evil. Let's not talk exactly. about Let's not yeah. talk about hard, difficult things, and we'll just float along. Oh well, that's a that's a whole other that's a whole other right. conversation yeah, there right. too. Yeah, well, right. I, I mean, as you know, as we talked about on an earlier podcast, like the life of my dad since my my parents were divorced when I was younger, um, before my mother remarried, um, 
uh, life with my dad was anything was allowed. So I, I could talk mm. about, you all were this. the adult. So I, you were the I adult. Yeah, so I never got in trouble because <laughs> I, it wasn't like I had to sneak out or do, I just would say, yeah, actually my dad would push me to do those things. I'm like, no, I'm good. Thanks. Um, mm. uh, but, but yeah, uh, my mom had a saying when I, when I was a little younger, um, you know, there was a, there was a one block walk from my school back to my house. It was, and all these really cool trees along that road, that, that street. And my mother used to say, well, if I can't find Eric playing with his friends, I just have to look up because he's probably in some tree. And that was <laughs> that was that was the part. Like nowadays, everybody's so nervous about like yeah, uh, playgrounds have yeah, rubber yeah. mats and monkey bars yeah. don't exist anymore. Nothing made of metal. Yeah, I was like yeah. at least twenty to yeah. thirty feet up in any tree I could find. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> um, another thing though that you guys. Um, kind of have in common is, uh, Eric, you've discussed how your sense of humor helped you negotiate going to different schools yes. and creating relationships at different times in, in your most early developmental years. And because Greg's father was s- serving, right. uh, there was a lot of moving around for Greg as well. So, mm. Greg, do you think that some of that forced uh, having to integrate with different people at different times had anything to do with your facility to to entertain and create relationships and yeah did, did i mean that, i'm sh- i'm sure def- that at all yeah yeah i'm sure definitely i mean i moved pretty much every two to three years i wow. i mean yeah. i was probably in like yeah. 12 schools and i think yeah like you it, 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 none of this is conscious it's now just kind of looking back there's nothing i was conscious of at the time but sure. certainly like yeah, like I need to fit in. I want to make friends. I was super facile at kind of moving between all sorts of groups and talking to right. all sorts of different people. And and part of that was my personality. And part of it was kind of like I'm in a new place and I don't want to be lonely and I'm desperate to connect. And mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot yeah. of the performing came out of that. Like I want attention. Look at me. You know, all that stuff in high school. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that that played I'm sure that played into a lot of it too. And, and at the base of it, it was just like, I don't want to be by myself. You know what I mean? I need to make friends. I'm in this new school. I need to ingratiate myself with these other people. And yeah. So you tap mm-hmm. dance a bit, you know? Yeah. So another step that I think everyone, our listeners included can relate to if they've taken a few steps toward their goal, their, you know, on the, on the, hero's journey right there is this other step that refers to supernatural aid and and that's and that's kind of like when luke skywalker meets obi-wan kenobi you 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 receive the benefit or, or you know having a mentor figure of some sort right you receive the benefit of their wisdom to help you on your path right what what, what about that resonates with you at all i mean certainly my uncle but i think and dan mm-hmm. i'm sure you would agree with this I I just look back so fondly on our time at Rutgers. Like I just feel super Absolutely. super Absolutely. lucky. Like the the yep. the teachers, because it wasn't just Bill Esper that I, we really only had a relationship at the end of our four years. But you know right, Maggie right. Flanagan, who is recently she's amazing. Yeah, she recently retired. I think she's teaching a master class. But she's one of the preeminent teachers in the city. We had Vicky Hart, who went on. She yeah. went on to head right. the Meisner program at NYU. We had Barbara Marchant, yeah. who we just yeah. had these. Inc- we had inc- that's what I. Re- I mean, and, I remember a lot of things about school, but what I remember is getting there, and even mm-hmm. in the first week, going like, "Oh my, these people are not screwing around. Like this is." Oh no, this it was is professional serious. acting training program. Yeah. It wasn't like kitty, you know, uh, stuff. And and for Maggie Flanagan to be a preeminent acting teacher in the city of New York, yeah. That's that's quite the accomplishment. Well, yeah, and we no, had, no we insult had... to other cities, but that city is known for for acting. Yeah, no, she is she's a name. I mean, every agency, every casting director that she was, and she was fantastic. So, I mean, but it wasn't just that. I mean, you know, Dan, it was all the movement teachers, the yeah. voice teachers. There were just a ton of amazing Williamson. people there. Yeah, yep. yeah. So, yep. I th- that's probably it. I mean, that our time there, we just had a ton of of. The training was amazing and the opportunity yes. to perform the directors. They, you know, even you mentioned Ed Stern, like he was amazing. He went on to yeah. head the Cleveland yep. Playhouse and yes, won a few Tony awards because of the, his regional theater. Like, right. I, and it's not right. that it's not, I think it's still a really strong program. I, I do kind of feel like, uh, 
Well, that might, that might not be true. Uh, part of me feels like it was the heyday because it was also at a time when, you know, they had this cut policy in place that we had to be asked back the first two years, which actually wow. is absurd. And they ended up getting rid of it because it was it was really detrimental to a lot of people. I but Dan and I, that pressure, oh, that, that, yeah. oh, wow. Well, it's also this dichotomy of like, don't take risk, fall on your face, but. You may not be asked back to the program. <laughs> That's yeah. That I can I can tell you that does not sound that does not sound like a positive message at all. Right, and you would presume the university would want the money anyway. But so, but the the the, the orientation of uh, freshman year, there was like thirty of us. Yeah, I'd say I think there was thirty five. And then first day of class on junior year, there was six. Eight? Six. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. But talk you, about survivor's guilt. I guess <laughs> I guess sort of getting you ready for rejection um is is part of the process, but as uh, as Greg was saying, like this is this is where you're supposed to take those risks, fall on your face and and yeah. uh and, yeah. and make yeah. mistakes so that you can learn from them, not uh and you're gone. You know, wow. <laughs> right. And I yeah, I don't right. think and I think they got rid of it a long time ago. Great. I, what I remember it being problematic is that there were people after our sophomore year who were cut from the program that should have never been cut. And it mm. it's okay. You can teach about rejection in the business without cutting 18-year-old kids from an acting program. Yes. And it became like a numbers right, game right. because we started combining classes with the graduate program. So we by our senior year, we had every class with the graduate students because Dan and I got BFA, so we were in the bachelor program. Okay. Anyway, it, it was kind of... So yeah, in terms of mentors, I would... I definitely kind of always... I mean, I wrote, I wrote a note to Vicky Hart the other day. I, I've, I've emailed Maggie. You know, I went, my uncle and I went to Bill's memorial service, which was at a Broadway house a few years ago. Like, I, that time is super deep in my bones, I think, you know? Yeah, those cut policies were, were really brutal, which um, leads me to one of the next steps on the hero's journey, which is the trials, the difficulties mm. that uh, we have to get through in order to get to where we want to go. So mm -hmm. obviously the pressure of those yeah. of those cuts. I mean, I remember that was the most intimidating thing I had experienced up to that point. Yeah, and and it was difficult because even if you were lucky enough to be accepted to the next year, your friends right. are going through a devastating rejection. Yeah, it was really destabilizing for everyone. I re especially after sophomore year, because like I said, I mean, there were maybe a couple people in that class that you could say maybe didn't deserve to come back, but there were like six or seven actors, our friends that were cut. That so I yeah. know you're indirectly referring to me, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so. so did they do it? Just so because I'm I, I'm sort of a, a you know I don't really get this this dynamic of that. Um, right. Did they do it? privately in a letter or was it like posted like they would do like when you make a spot on a football team yeah no they would throw I, things at yeah, you exactly. and if you it got hit by more tomatoes stoning. you're out yes yeah, so uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> thumb no, down it, right and yeah, then oh, that's that, it. <laughs> exactly it was a big hook you had to stand out of the stage <laughs> right. and then, see uh, that i would i would appreciate some <laughs> some vaudeville borschbelt humor be like hey, right. well, there was good. a bit <laughs> there was a bit of a gladiatorial feeling to it at the end because while you're being evaluated on your performance and behavior throughout the academic year a lot of it rested on what they called the what was it the final performance yeah the final or? presentations because yeah, we did final presentations a few was. different yeah. you had to do an acting scene voice and our freshman year you had to do movement i guess so yeah you would do yeah. you would do this presentation in, in front of the entire faculty and then i think within a few weeks they sent letters to everyone but i still mm -hmm. remember yeah uh, that's seared in my brain too being in my i had a great uncle that lived in the city being in his apartment on East 86th and we were all kind of calling each other. And I was like, what? Like, because we went from <laughs> yeah. 16 to six, like they cut 10 yeah. kids from the class. So Brutal. Wow. it was rough. Yep. Um, but that wasn't the only trial, uh, certainly not for an artist's journey an actor's journey in particular. Right. So after graduating, uh, what was overall a very wonderful uh, educational experience and just a, a developing as a person experience. Right. What what were some of the trials ahead? I think the main thing for me was there were trials going on, but I wasn't in touch with them. So 
Yeah, yeah. E- even if I was having a hard time, I I was like in some sort of I think some sort of denial about it, and that's that's part of how I grew up and how I learned to emotionally deal with things, which could be beneficial at times, mm-hmm. especially if things were going good, like um, you know whatever positive attitude. I got along. I was always in a good mood, kind of. So I, if I had trials going on in my twenties, I was in denial of them or I was ignoring them. Um. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I mean, I know in in my late twenties, I kind of fell off a cliff emotionally, um, because I became aware, you know, because I was kind of struggling in my life. I was struggling professionally. Mm-hmm. I was struggling personally. Mm-hmm. I felt kind of lost. But I had I I had learned, you know, up until the age of twenty eight, how to, to to emotionally cope with things was not to kind of deal with things that felt problematic or difficult. Um, and so it was like a real wake up call. And like, I'm kind of talking about it pragmatically at the time it was terrible. Like I, I went into a depression and it, it really, so I think I probably had some trials and I had some bumps, but I just wasn't aware of them. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and, and part of the turn, which took a really long time once I kind of, and also I just, just not to interrupt you, but just, just to throw into that. Yeah. Of course I had a window. I knew you through that. It's not like we, we we didn't know each other in that time. I saw you go into that descent. Oh yeah, yeah, and it was a real descent. I mean, I was definitely isolated from friends. I I I, I wasn't as successful as I wanted to be, but I wasn't in touch with it. But more than that, I think I was seeing a therapist at the time, and and part of what I was talking to her about, she was like, um, it, she was kind of like, well, what do you want to do? Like, what are your dreams? And so I sort of laid them all out. But what she sort of pointed out to me is that they were all existing in my head. I mean, I was doing fine. Mm. I was getting a few commercials here and there and some voiceover and I was working a little bit. But I, I really came face to face with like, oh, you're not really doing, oh, these are all your dreams? Oh, you're not really doing the work to get to try to get there. And I wasn't really, but I also wasn't in touch with it. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was like, a, it was a big hole. I mean, it took me a few years because it really felt like I had to readjust like the capacity to take in mm-hmm. struggle along with Triumph. Mm-hmm. And I had done pretty well. You know, I had friends in high school. I was fairly popular. I got into this great acting school. I made it through, you know, but what started to happen in my late twenties is I had some bumps. You, you graduated, you graduated with honors. Yeah. I, yeah. I graduated with honors. I had a commercial agent. I was, I was acting a little bit, but you know, then suddenly I wasn't, I wasn't working much. I had had some relationships that hadn't worked out mostly because of me. And I was, I was at a point where I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I just felt super adrift. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a dark, I, I, this is not uncommon. I think a lot of times people in their late twenties, because it is that kind of transition period of like, okay, what do I want to do with my life? Who am I now? I, I can't keep <laughs> oh, this. Oh, I'm really around. an adult now, aren't I? Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you also chose a profession that is constantly basically selling yourself. Right. So you're dealing, you're just, I mean, I I try to tell people that imagine if you were constantly going on like a blind date five times a day and, and, you Mm -hmm. know, and you have to remember that they're not judging you. You just might not be the right fit for some, you know, the role for so many reasons. But basically you walk away from that audition day and and say, well, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I guess those five people don't like me. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's not. It, it, and that doesn't well, help if you're in a dark place on top of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that was hard. I mean, I think what I was doing was I was playing it really safe and I didn't know I was. Mm. So I had to get past that and sort of to be in the game. If my dream was whatever it was, like I would like to be on a TV show or I, I want to be on Broadway. I was not doing the things I was really holding myself back, you know, in personal relationships, professionally. But I wasn't a. I wasn't even aware of it. And then when it got kind of pointed out to me and I realized like, wow, I'm nowhere near where I want to be and certainly where I think I am in my mind. Because I remember this therapist mm. saying, I'm like, yeah, I'm doing this and this and this. And she was like, are you? Are you? You don't, you're not really doing that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not really doing that. And then when I got in touch with that, I was, I was absolutely freaking terrified. You know, I was like, oh my God. And right. Yeah, so I really I really fell off a cliff and it you know ironically I would say one of the things that started digging me out was was four kids and getting that mm-hmm, work mm-hmm. there was kind of stabilizing. So Mhm. Mm-hmm. Cuz I mean I've had a million trials and tribulations. I mean I'm an actor like it it's all ups and it's downs. It's it's part of the territory. Yeah, 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 it's like Eric said it's it's mostly rejection and that's why I tell people like you better love it. 
<laughs> you better love it. Yeah. You're gonna do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would say that that period in my late twenties into my early thirties was super rough. It was really rough. Yeah. Yeah. And, that was the hardest time I've seen you go through. Oh yeah. I mean, I re- I really that I, that I know of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. By far. I mean, I basically kind of lo- lost my mind. And when I look back at it. I mean, I'm so grateful because I think it got, you know, it's like any of this, and this is part of, it seems to be part of the hero's journey is like, I had to go through this fire. I mean, my only regret mm-hmm. is, is it, it took as long as it did. I mean, it really was a few years that I really had to dig myself out of a hole. Uh, and it was really, it was really painful, but I, yeah. I only yeah. got to where I wanted to go because I went through this sort of like metamorphosis of like, dude, you can't keep moving through the world this way. This is not working. Right. Right, and it hadn't right. worked for a few years, and I wasn't just—I was kind of ignoring it or in denial of like. Right. But then it reached right. a point where like, oh no, 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 dude, you're kind of lost, and you don't know what you're doing, and you're not doing the things you're telling yourself you're doing. So, right. So anyway, well, and and when when we met, I had already been losing my mind for a while. <laughs> right. So we both went through it just at different times. <laughs> well, I yeah. think every, I mean, doesn't, I mean, Eric, I feel like everyone's had their time in the barrel. I mean, Eric, I, yeah. I'm sure well, you've Well, also, some... but like I can say of both of you, and, and I know that I'm, you know, I don't know you both uh, heart and soul down to your, you know, finest Adam, but I've seen Eric go through, you know, through a period of becoming more available, almost like more himself right. after being out of the crucible that was New York mm-hmm. and, you know. I've I've shared that with Eric before, yeah. but anyway, I, mean, so I don't mean to speak for you. What, Eric, what I think is great about um, uh, Greg's experience is that this shows that you can go to such a, a darker place, um, yeah. But that something motivates you to change mm. for the better for himself, rather than being crippled by it. Um, what's interesting right. to me as someone who does know you well, but doesn't know everything that you uh, are involved in uh, creatively. Um, you're a little bit more of a renaissance man to me than mm. um, I think the fan base even knows. I mean, with the intro yeah. that Dan gave you, great. But um, you, you're not just a, and I, don't, I say just because I am one, uh, voice actor. Um, <laughs> adding in even just the on camera and the plays and the and the stage stuff, which both of you have done. Um, right, you said you'd never do that. Yeah, that's not. I mean, I did it in high school, but that that was my my being on stage and performing is in music, which is you know the exaggerated version of Eric Stewart. I mean, that's what we do. We still right. It's mm-hmm. still it's mm-hmm. still my 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 who I am. But it's a it's a persona. But it's a right. persona. But you know, it, and of course, <laughs> if someone doesn't like that. They truly don't like me, right? Right, <laughs> right, right. right. It's, right? It's, good, it's good litmus. But, yeah. but, but I, I, oh, I'm always fascinated by the on camera and stage actors because I feel like it's almost, it's literally in your face when, when mm. it's either we like you, we don't. I mean, you can, you right. could see yeah. it yeah. on the, on the, uh, when you're auditioning, you could feel it. And, and we're already so, um, critical of our physicalities and right. our, our looks and, and all, all of these things. I'm, am I get, I'm getting too old and for these roles. I feel like there's so much additional pressure not yep. to take away the skill set that we have as voice actors, but there's a whole other side of the trials to me when you're also dealing with what you physically look like. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. And I think sure. at a certain point I've done it for so long, like you just have to shift Mm-hmm. I mean, because if you don't shift, you'll just quit. Like I, I, I mean, it's not that I don't have disappointment. I, I definitely, I have auditions I don't get. I feel disappointed, but you, because otherwise you'll just bang your head against the wall. And I, mm-hmm. I mean, I certainly do a little bit of that, but what I've evolved to over the years is like, I just forget about it because, and hopefully you mm-hmm. get it. And if you don't, mm-hmm. you don't. Yep. And some are harder than others mm-hmm. because if you're every time, sure. Questioning yourself and like, oh, it didn't look right. I, maybe that wasn't great. Why don't they like me? You you yeah. gotta quit <laughs> because it's just it, it can't be that if it's that miserable you know and maybe you guys have this experience too so I'd be curious I mean I think I'm kind of a renaissance man for a few reasons like at a certain point I knew if I wanted to make a living and I tell this to young actors too like I needed to do more than one thing you know and that's why mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. was doing voiceover and I was doing commercials and I was trying to do television but I also did audio books and mm-hmm. I I and. I wanted to tell stories, so I made a web series, and then I started directing because of that. And I knew that if I 
I wanted to do all that stuff and I wanted to explore it creatively, but I also knew like, okay, if I want to really cobble together a living, I, I've got to make sure I, I can do a lot of, of different things, you know? And it doesn't mm-hmm. come across as someone who's watching it from afar. It does not come across as you're trying to find your day job to support your, lo- your passion in the arts. Right. All of your projects that you do, it seems like you truly do enjoy those things. Mm. You found yeah. they have, multiple they have a ways. Root creativity, yeah. Yeah, yeah you found yeah. most multiple ways to express your creativity. Whether some are the ones that pay the bills more than others, but right. it just doesn't seem like you, you know it's compromised. It seems like I, I've, and this is as I said, someone that watches from afar. It seems like wow, he does this really well, this really well. This is funny. This is uh, you know who I, I think that that really helps, especially for a lot of our listeners who have a lot of interests, you don't seem to dabble. You seem to embrace all of those with the same passion, though I bet if we asked you what would you get rid of and what what, what you couldn't get rid of, you know, we know what the answer is. But but it's the same. uh, It it does not appear that way from uh, the viewer as myself. Greg has always radiated competence Hmm. ever since I've known him. Yeah, and like your background with filmmaking, like it, with, with sh- all the video work you do, like was that something that you decided to, you were going to immerse yourself in and learn how to do? Or you, you, did you pick that up? Uh, and then Dan was talking about you being a writer. These are things like th- that that are not just like, yeah, today I think I'm going to become a creative writer. That's what I'm going to do. Like it, it takes time, skill, and it also takes practice. So you must have found some other guidance in the many things you do yeah i mean i i mean the main thing was i think just like you guys eric it's the reason eric you play music and dan you draw and write and i do i i like to be creative i also don't think there's anything wrong with ambition i mean i think it's Mm -hmm. sort of shifted it sort of shifted for me once i went through the cauldron i mean because i think in my 20s yeah i probably wanted to be famous and be on a television show and (laughs) but it was sort of based in it was based in other things, sort of a, a neediness or what, whatever it was. I mean, so once I sort of moved through that, and I still deal with it, but I, I think I reached a point where I was like, yeah, of course I would still like that to happen. Of course I want to be on a television show. I, you know, mm-hmm. I just finished The White Lotus. Of course I had moments where I was like, I would kill to be in Sicily right? sh- uh, acting in a show like White Lotus. So that's right. okay, but it can't be the reason that, I, I, I what I for myself that the the thing that's driving me and 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 so you know when I when I was in my early thirties I guess or or maybe later so I ended up making a web series and it really came out of sort of wanting to control my own creative destiny which was I you know because acting is a lot of you audition then you sit around you wait for the phone to ring right. it's in everyone else's hands. I knew I, I I knew I couldn't make a movie. I didn't have the money or I didn't have a time the time. So I thought, okay, what if I made these like three to five minute shorts? Mm-hmm. I can I wanted to learn filmmaking. I knew And you're I, already you're already becoming you're a young father at that point. Right. You can't just yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I had responsibilities. I was like, how do I do this because I really want to do it and have it be manageable? So I wrote a, you know, three to four minute shorts and I had four or five crew members and I paid the cameraman a hundred bucks and I taught myself how to edit so I didn't have to mm-hmm. pay someone because I knew I, I knew I had this impulse to be like I really want to learn I really want to do this and I really want to control it yep. um I know you guys have had the same experience because what ended up happening and that was for nobody but me it, and I didn't even right. really market it as well as I should have it was more for me it was like I want to make something I want to put this out there but I really just want to make something but because yeah, I made that yeah. web series, I ended up getting all of this production work and it kind of spiraled over the next mm-hmm. 10 years, you know? And I, I'm sure you guys, so that's, I guess my point is like, that came out of a pure, like, I want to make something. It didn't come out of like, oh man, I want to make this and then I, I want to sell it as a TV show and then right. I'll be, you know? And <laughs> I think also, that's what shifted, it, so. It it rang true. Yeah. I mean, you were saying you did it, you did it for yourself. I mean, I feel like... uh you know, to, to draw the parallel with, with, with music and stuff like that, uh, um, I always can tell the artists that I believe and the ones that I don't, um, you know, from right. the material that they're singing or whatever they're doing, the same thing. It's like you, you put that together um, for yourself, and that's why it was so good. Whether someone liked it or not, 
you were also proud of it. Um, you enjoyed doing it and leading to other work. I mean, that's a bonus. The fact right. that mm-hmm. someone saw that and said, hey, hey, we really like what you did. But, um, you know, patting yourself on the back a little bit. The reason that they took notice is because you created it from the heart. You you did not right. you did not have the monetary goal. That was the the thing that might have watered down your choices. You know, trusting yeah, I f- your I gut. Feel, I feel like it was driven from a, a different place. I mean, Eric, you yeah. you do yeah. it. I mean, I've always been yeah. I've always admired your drive. Like, you know, um I'm I know you have dreams and ambitions as a, as a musician and you continue mm-hmm. to create and make music and it's to me it's always it's come it, it I can tell it can it comes from the same place that sure. you know, like that web series came from that you're like I want to mm-hmm. do this. I'm going to do it as well as I can. I'm going to make it professional. I'm going to put it out there. And so, yeah, I just, I mean, you, maybe you don't know that, but I, I've always admired your, your drive. I, I think oh, it's thank you. awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I was going to say in response to that, it's for me, it's uh, the drive to do everything else that I do is to give me the freedom to create my own mm-hmm. music the way I, I want right, to do it right, uh, right, for right. my own soul. I mean, we, we talk right. about those dark places and, and, and the, and, and that road that we've all, that we've all traveled. Um, yeah. If it weren't for that outlet, uh, you know, for many, many of, of, of my years, I would be in an even angrier young man, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And in both of your examples, there's something that happens when you take ownership and responsibility for your own creativity, mm-hmm. mm. and it, and part of what happens is a sense a sense of authenticity, yeah, which is something that yeah. Eric was just talking about, and that that also comes through in Greg's work. So, yeah. well, and, and I'm sure and, you guys uh, feel it too, and yeah. esteem. I think I think when you get up and you're just sure, trying to sure. work on something that has well, meaning for you, right. and it's coming from that place, you know, right, and and some of that esteem, which is such an important word, such a such an important thing, um, has to do with certainly the end result. Yes, but as as Greg, you were just saying, that esteem is being built because you're giving yourself the time to do it. Right. You're you're paying yourself that level of respect. Right. Yeah, which is hugely relevant. Um, I had a I had a quick question I wanted to ask Greg about um a, the, a performance part. Um, because I'm curious. Any any time I meet someone who performs for a living, um. What about stage fright? What about um, <laughs> what 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 do you do? Or maybe you're not affected so much by it. But what is? Do you have a process? How do you how do you deal with that? Whether it's stepping on stage for that opening night or whatever it is, or the and we're rolling kind of thing and on a right. on a TV shoot. Right. What is your uh, weapon for that? I mean. I haven't done Xanax. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, marijuana. Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't done. You know, like I just shot this Law and Order thing. Yeah. Like, like a month ago or a few weeks ago. Um, I think it, part of it is preparation. That's not mm-hmm. anything revelatory. I think if I know that I'm super super prepared. Um, Dan and I had a teacher at school. Um, Leonard. It was Petit, right? Yeah. Had it? Petit. Petit. Yeah. So he taught Michael Chekhov, which is actually an you know a, a style that we didn't really oh, do. Oh, I know where you're going with there. this. The four brothers. So yeah, the four brothers, and one of the brothers is the brother of Ease. Um, and so I think that's hugely important in performance, and it's just something I try to keep in mind, and and whatever it takes to get you there, like feeling relaxed, feeling comfortable, feeling open. I mean, I'm also just older, and so I. I don't have it as much. Like I, I wasn't nervous on the Law and Order set really mm-hmm. at all. I mean, it was really a close to the vest part too. Mm-hmm. But I, I'd, be, I'd been on enough sets over the years, and I think part of it—that's part of it too. Like I think it's—I'm sure Eric at this point. Well, it's not that I don't get some butterflies, but like you've performed so many times, right? Um, the repetition of that, and so I think it. I think it also probably will depend on what's called for in the moment. Um, yeah, I mean. Uh, I remember I had a callback for a pretty big part, um, a pretty big part on like a, a mini series. I didn't end up getting it, but it was on Zoom, which was annoying. But I was in Michigan, <laughs> and I mm-hmm. remember in the waiting room. And I also knew because it was hard because part of me in my brain was like, "Wow, if I got this, this could really change things for me." Oh, right. I about had an anxiety attack because also they kept me in this waiting room. 
and I'm I'm in a cottage in Michigan by myself, sitting in front of my laptop, and it was like 15 minutes, and it was all Ugh. I could do to to jump out of my skin. Um, and I and so really, I mean, I think I was able to be present in that moment, but I I guess that's well, for me, it's like preparation, like work on it as hard as you can, so you're not you're not doubting whether you. I know I did it. So it's like you're almost telling yourself like, hey, I've done the work. I've done it. You're fine. You're fine. You've worked on right. this. You've thought about this. Um, and then it's really that sense of ease and whatever you can do, whatever you need to do to get yourself there. So, Right. Now, that's interesting. But you also have a confidence in the fact that you've prepared so that you've that is also helping to put you at ease. Um so I don't know. Do you it, feel ner- do you feel nervous when you perform? Well, still, uh, Dan and I have talked about this on, on earlier shows. Um, I think that that like anything, um, nervousness is is an energy. So you can mm. either let it cripple you beforehand or you can take it and use it. Um, I normally take a power nap for about 15 mm. minutes by myself uh, right. backstage um, to gather that energy up for the moment. I mean, yeah, yeah I, kn- I know. But like like any live theater... It's the unexpected that makes it exciting, but also, you know, um, that's the nervousness of it. It'd be one thing if I was in the studio or uh, we can just keep doing take after take, but that's it. Uh, But then again, also, uh, it also disappears into the ether, which hopefully people have not recorded that mistake. Um, But yeah, (laughs) I've always done that. I've I've used that nervous energy um, to to, uh, kick off the show with it. Well, but, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, yes. I think that's a really fair point cuz actually it's not you want some of that. It's not you know, of course, yeah, totally, man. Like and also it's it it there's no there's no universe where it's like I'm going to get rid of this. You can't. So and and to take it into performance, like you said, Eric, like I did a musical this summer, like you want to walk onto stage with a little bit of that adrenaline and energy. Mm-hmm. To fill the yeah. space and even coming into an audition, because if you do try to say like, "Don't feel that," "Don't feel that," "Don't feel that," you you can't do that. It's impossible. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, because yeah. a lot of our fans have asked us about things where you know that the, that the the stage fright or being nervous about an audition, all of these things, and I just think it's helpful to hear that we all deal with that in different oh, ways yeah. and how and yeah. how we mm-hmm. compensate for that and. Um, yeah, no, it, it's great. But when you were mentioning earlier that, you know, sometimes you do the ignorance is, is bliss. Sometimes people are just like, it's, it doesn't matter. It's, it right. doesn't matter to me. I'm just going to go in and do my thing. And if they like me, they like me. Mm. If they don't, they don't like, I don't care. Like, well, that there's, is, yeah, that's my goal. That's, that's my goal. Right. Yeah. Like I'm getting close to that, <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty much my goal right now. Like there are times where I go, yeah, no, I don't really care. <laughs> Well, that's huge, though. I think some of those simple things are are great. I think that, you know, if you yeah. can get to F it, I mean, you know, I've yeah. had teachers say that to yeah. me over the years. Yeah. Hey, F it. Walk on stage. Yeah. Who cares, man? Just F it and go for it. Yeah. It's like, that's yeah. true. If you can. But I think also, Eric, like you said, I mean, that's an ongoing battle. But I have that mm-hmm. in my mind, too. Like, hey, man, let it go. You're here. Do the best you can. Be in the moment. Let's go. You know? Yep. This re- this reminds me of, of two things. I've been reading through some quotes recently because I'm I'm putting some up on on Twitter at Dan Green Voices, and um, uh, many of them are along the lines of if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Right. 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 <laughs> and so putting yourself in that place where you have to confront something. But another thing this reminds me of is um, there were there was an audition for this movie that turned out to be not so great called Swing Kids. This is way back. Oh, right. In the 90s. Right. Yeah. And, and I got a call back for it. And, and um, I was sitting in the waiting room going, working through my nerves. And, and then I told myself, but wait a minute. Maybe I'm going to be really good. Maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm going to do well in this callback. Right? I shared that story with Vicki Hart, who was one of our teachers at the time. And she said, Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, that's what you should do. <laughs> hold on to that, right? You hold on to that. That was very that's, smart. That's pretty. That's yeah. pretty great that you could do that at that age. I mean, I think another big well, part of this. I'm it sure didn't, it, I didn't. I didn't. I for some reason they ended up casting this guy called Christian Bale. I don't what? know if you ever heard of him. No. Yeah. Has he yeah. performed? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think it's getting well, comfortable with that gremlin on your shoulder that and talking with that guy. That's like, you're crap. What are you doing? You can't do this. You know what I mean? Right. That's an ongoing battle. Which is such sure. a familiar voice. Yeah. Such a familiar voice. Yeah. 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 Well, everybody has those those, you know, negative voices, that <laughs> that negative talk thing. 
Um, actually, one of my favorite moments from the recent Spider-Man film, No Way Home, is the, the Tobey Maguire version is talking to the, the Andrew Garfield version. He's like, I think I'm hearing a lot of negative talk. No, you are amazing. You know, like, that is so funny. Right. <laughs> but speaking of being amazing, I, I am also uh, going to enter this conversation uh, with Eric in our next episode that is focused on these steps of the hero's journey, apotheosis. Hmm. And uh, just, just to frame it uh, f- for our listeners, it's the point where the hero has, has achieved this greater understanding and you feel that you have this new knowledge or perception to, to apply to, to achieving your adventure. It's after you've confronted, you've had atonement with the father, which is where you confront the thing that has the most power over you. Right. You're, you're, you're coming out the other side of it uh, more complete, more whole. Uh, to, to make a, a you know a Star Wars comparison, it's you know <laughs> the final confrontation with Luke against the Emperor, and he's he's really a Jedi after that. But anyway, so um, so Greg, any of that ring true for you? Yeah, I mean, I I'm definitely not at the understanding completely, which I think makes sense. Like I'm trying. And who is? Yeah, who yeah. Is? And I right. maybe you never get there, but I think I mean there's definitely a, a few things I try to focus on now. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been doing in the pandemic, I started doing morning pages, which is a artist way thing. And I've kept it, I've been doing it now for like a few years and I've just found it really helpful to get up in the morning and sort of dump. Um, right. Right. I mean, I, I think the main thing I, 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 I'm constantly, it, it always comes up when I'm writing in morning pages and I'm kind of thinking about, cause I can, I, everyone can do this, but I can spiral forward when I'm thinking about the future. I can wake up in the middle of the night and have anxiety about either what's come or what's come before but more what's come like suddenly it's three in the morning and i'm i'm ruminating on something that has not occurred um right and so mostly i keep i always and this is so simplistic but i i do feel like a lot of these simplistic things they work and so i'm constantly like dude just stay in the moment just stay what can you do today what is right in front of you don't worry about tomorrow don't look back. Don't look forward. Like do the best you can right in this moment. Cause I can start to spiral out. Um, Oh, I completely relate to that. So that's, that's probably the main thing I, I kind of work on. And it's funny. I, I'm, I'm staring at it cause I, I taped this quote to my computer. I have a few taped up there and, um, I, this sort of speaks to it. And it, again, like when I read it, I was like, Oh man, th- I'm finding this so helpful. So I read Michael Caine wrote a, he wrote a autobiography, he wrote a memoir, which was Super charming Mm -hmm. and great. But at the end, there was this quote. Find what you love and do it as well as you can. Pursue your dream, and even if you never catch it, you'll enjoy the chase. The rest comes Mm. down to luck, timing, and God. And even if you don't believe in him, he believes in you. And when all of that runs out, use the difficulty. And so Mm. I'm not religious. I think the thing that really jumped out at me was pursue your dream. And even if you never catch it, you'll enjoy the chase. And to me, that's what I was like. Yes. Okay, man. Just Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. work on these things. Do the best you can. Don't worry about the outcome. You know, it's okay to be Mm -hmm. ambitious and work hard. And because I I can definitely spiral. So I'm constantly like, be here now, dude. Be just here. What's in Mm -hmm. front of you? And so I, mm-hmm. I haven't figured that out, but when I was reading over, because I knew you were going to talk about the hero's journey, when I saw apotheosis, have you come to an understanding? No, but the, that's one of the main things I'm constantly thinking about, you know, mm-hmm. in my day to day. I don't know. Well, Does that my, resonate? Does well, that resonate one of, with well, maybe, of you guys? Maybe what, I mean, well, maybe part of what you're understanding is that you don't ever have complete understanding. Right, right. You shouldn't let a lack of complete understanding paralyze you. I mean, one of my catchphrases is that success is not the pot of gold. It's it's the journey. It's like if right. you are mm-hmm. actually following what you love to do, that's success. There are too many artists that never made money when they were alive. So you right. you know you you can't really judge mm-hmm. it on a monetary level. So the fact that you are mm-hmm. pursuing something you love to do to me is successful. Yeah, I mean, I think mm-hmm. I've tried to get to that. I mean, it's part of why I'm getting an MFA in television writing, and I'm old, but I was like, I'm really, I want to do this. I'm interested in this, um, and it's like one of the best decisions I've made. I'm I'm almost done with the program. The people in my class are amazing. It's been it's been so amazing. I'm so glad I did it, and I was really kind of terrified because I. I, I I, it, it's actually Alan Kingsburg is the head of the program. Yeah, that's sure. Why I knew Alan, about it. Great yeah. guy, talented guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I remember mm-hmm. my wife 
I was talking to her and I was like, I don't know, I'm so old and do I really gonna do this? And she literally looked at me at some point and we had a few conversations and I was hemming and hawing and she was like, you know, Greg, you're just gonna die. And I just yeah. went, wow, I guess you're right. She's like, just do it. It's two years, we can figure it out. And so anyway. And also it makes more sense that you're doing it now. You, you oh, I was say at the it, place like, for it, yeah. Yeah, you're saying yeah. that you're old and, and you're starting this thing, but in in all honesty, your journey has brought you to this place where you're probably at the right time yes. in your life to do the best work. You, you're, mm -hmm. you're someone who's been on set. You understand the nuances of production, the, the highs, right. the lows, all of that. Yeah, now go write for it and write, right. mm -hmm. and write great stuff for it and create. I totally could see you. Um, having a show that you were writing and also directing, sure. and yeah, you know, I, can see I that. totally see that. Um, yeah, Thanks, no, that's man. great. Man. That would no, be it's nice. True. But yeah, it's been it's been. And I, yeah, I don't think I. There's a reason it's happening now. I think this is the time for me, and it makes sense. This is when I'm doing it. So hmm. anyway, yeah, great. That's great. Greg, you asked if 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 we've you know come to any you know higher level of understanding. Yeah, and. Uh, in regards to this journey of, you know, uh, creativity and inspiration and dealing with what you're dealt, which happens to be the tagline for our podcast. Um, I think something that's really been helpful for me to understand, and I'm getting better at understanding it, is that in regards to my creativity, the promise of what the future holds is irrelevant compared to the promise I'm making myself to achieve it. Hmm. Right. What about you, Eric? I love the fact that uh, I get to witness you, Dan, being creative on uh, uh, so many levels. Like, I find joy in that. I, I think it, I, I do. <laughs> You're the guy saying, no, Dan, you actually can draw. And I'm like, no. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if they only knew about all our pre-production meetings where, like, I, oh, I basically am telling you, you're good. And you're not paying <laughs> yeah, me to say yeah. that. I'm like, you're good at what That's you do. True. Um and 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 that's another thank you to the fans that have responded um, to the things that you've been putting out there. Um, it's true. You know, there's a there's a great old expression. Uh, it's a Yiddish expression translated is if uh, two people say you're drunk, you should go lie down. So basically, <laughs> enough people are saying you're drunk. Now wait a minute, Eric. Why is this coming up in a conversation? <laughs> <laughs> you're the one who bought the bottles of scotch that's bags. right <laughs> yes dan you're an alcoholic no yes <laughs> wait a second what's going on no but seriously uh, yeah and and for me i mean i i've i've given up the the rock star dream a long time ago i don't even think right. that that was part of the plan um right. i just love to 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 write and play music and sometimes i'm right i'm i definitely during the 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 lockdown, um, I contemplated hanging up the guitar and saying, I'm not going to do this anymore because there was no way to interact with an audience the way that I wanted to. And mm. I was missing so much uh, for my soul. Um, but that's coming back and there, and, and also just finding ways to be cre uh, creative. Um, I'm, a, I'm leaning a little bit more into the multimedia stuff too. I'm doing a, doing a music video with, with my wife, uh, uh, to a song that mm -hmm. I wrote was a, was a great experience. I, I'm not a big fan of being on camera. That's not my thing. Um, right. but mm -hmm. I do like to, I like the visual, uh, the storytelling. I like that. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, 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 sh I think I've gotten to the place for me where I know what I do for a living to pay my right. bills. Right. And then there's the part that I could never give up because it's who I am that, mm -hmm. I, you know, what, what, how do you retire from being a singer songwriter? I, I don't think I do. Like, like, yeah, like you your wife said, you, you yeah, die, you, stop. you know? Yeah, <laughs> oh, no, yeah. no, that's never going to stop. That's yeah. Gonna stop. Yeah. That, I mean, it does. Yeah. yeah. It really, as long as, as long as there is like, you know, uh, someone listening, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be a big audience. Um, I, I'll keep doing it, even if it's just for myself. I know. I right. mean, that's, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Mm hmm. Well, I think this is a good time to bring our conversation to a close for today. Again, Greg, thank you so much for joining us. It's yes, been a real you. pleasure discussing these things with you. Yeah, I love talking to you guys. I've I've said this many times before, but I really love the work that we did. It was fun to do the shows and you know, mm -hmm. but just chatting with you guys today reminds me like the best part of our whatever five, six, seven year run at four kids and Konami 
mm-hmm. was all the people we met. I mean, it was really a, it, yeah. it was such an amazing time. So I'm psyched. That's to when you met Alan with you guys. Yeah, met yeah. Alan, yeah. Ted, and yeah. Wayne, and um, mm-hmm. you, Eric, Veronica. Darren. Yeah, Veronica. There's just a ton of amazing people. So I feel super grateful for that time we had there. Yeah, well, and I think they need, reboot, they need to reboot. They need to reboot the original. I don't know what they're waiting for. <laughs> you know, I, it's I, it, we would love if, it if, if only they said that yes to the us most, doing the manga. If only that was the most popular story arc. Oh wait, wait! <laughs> <laughs> if only you guys had lines out the doors at conventions. Oh wait! <laughs> I pit, I, well, I keep I, pitching it to Yumi, so we'll see. Hopefully there you go. Someday. We'll see what we can do. I really, I really hope we get permission to do the manga yes. thing. Yeah, yes, that would be that would be the awesome. same characters in a new way. It wouldn't be hard to do, but I understand that there's a level of decisions that need to be make, made about that that have nothing to do with us. Right. Yes. So, anyway, but uh, again, thanks for joining us, Greg, Eric. It's always a pleasure to have you at my side. Yes, Dan, same. And it wouldn't mean anything without you, listeners out there. And our last episode, we addressed just a few of the letters that we have received. And I promise you, for those that we didn't get to this time, we will get to next time. And I was really encouraged today when I looked at the inbox. I was like, so many more letters just came in just because oh, cool. we the, that episode had dropped. And so I, I and I love what the what the responses have been, and to be part of such a thoughtful and uh, compassionate community is our privilege. So thanks to you all out there. And we'll look forward to the next time where we can enjoy another conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what you're dealt. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Adromeda Productions, We wish you well. Audromeda, always a sound choice.